audience, welcome back. Welcome back, guys. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Anyone, this is their first oh. time? Oh. First. First? If it's your first time, <laughs> let us know right now in the chat. And if you're an, if you're an overachiever, if it's your fourth time, if this wow. is session number four for you, <laughs> let us know in the chat yes. because I mean you need some praise. That's that's impressive. And we wanted to say hello. Oh, introduce yes. ourselves. I'm Emily and, and this I'm is Tyler Tyler. Ancliffe, and we're your pre-show hosts today. We've been having a lot of fun today. Oh, too much fun. Yeah. And I mean, who got to see session three? Because I have to say that was probably uh, the littest oh, session I've ever seen. With it the got, dance cam? It got a bit hot. <laughs> I mean, some sirens started to go off. Oh, who saw Pastor Mark yeah, do a devotion, a threw a fire alarm? I mean, that's Amazing. that's where experience kicks in right yes. there. And we wanted to welcome, we've got a few new people joining yes. us. East Africa. Hello. Good morning. Hey, India, guys. Good morning. So India, great to have yes. You with us. All our amazing pastors across India and churches in Africa. Big welcome. We love you guys. Welcome to Global Conference. And if you're watching on Zoom, don't forget to turn your cameras on yes. because you are very much part yes. of this experience. Hello, everyone. We've got Ryan we Waters see you on waving. Zoom. Hi. Pastor C3 Mumbai with Rachel. You. Hey, guys. Oh, gosh. All right, we have got another. We have a game. Yes, game let's do it. Guys. So okay, we have some guests. special guests. Can you yes. please, if you're on the chat, I want, I want to see some like clapping hand emojis. I want to see some fire because we have, welcoming back, we have Pastor Mel and Nick Hines from C3 Balcon here Woo in Australia. Come on okay. over. Hello, how are you? Everybody. Fabulous. Great to have you guys. So looking forward to this. We get all the fun stuff. You, yeah. you look a little nervous. Yes. Um, Not at all? No. Not even a little bit? Terrified. Very, actually, terrified. You guys scare us. We all scare right. you. We're you very scary. Yeah. This challenge is called What's, What's in, in the, the Box? box. Oh, good. oh, it's a good question. What's in the box? Pastor and Nick and Mel will be blindfolded. Mm -hmm. Good. And we'll Got be that. placing Love something that. in the box for them to feel and guess what it is. Oh, what is it? Is it going to be alive? Yeah. Is it going to bite them? <laughs> We have some very scary things here in Australia. Yes, and Australia. Just a Down Under is known oh, yes. as, as the country yes. of the deadly. Things that kill you. And yep. just a disclaimer that all live things have been treated with total respect. Yes, we've animal. Yep. Yeah, we've got That's, a supervisor yeah. here, so no yeah. need to worry about that side of things. I actually so. think all the smoke in this room has sedated the animals. Yes. So it's a little right. it's a little safer. Right. Right. No okay, should we right. blindfold you up? Guys, totally, please, please do. Good please do. Blindfold, pass them out. Mick, when and then on, once they're on, Emily's. Um, I'm gonna place the first. Right. Not that it's a competition, competition, but I want to go first. Uh, they, okay, they okay, actually pass work. Pass them, pass them now. Wow, we'll go like first. They do work. Okay. They do work. Yes. yes well, um, they're from Kmart, so if you need a great, <laughs> if you need a great That's eye awesome. mask. Is my hair okay? It, your hair looks great. Your hair looks you great. Know, you guys aren't even okay. here anymore, are you? The first you're critter. Just, <laughs> we have left. We're about to be just standing here. Okay. Just be really gentle with your hands. Okay. Okay. Do you like? Small animals. Oh yes. Yes. No, Do not too small. Uh, I mean, no, I mean, it's like in the mix between a okay. dog and. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. And it's really dog may... in that box. Okay. Oh. Really okay. gently. Don't don't fall. Yeah. Okay. So going really soft. Oh. Yeah. Here we go. In the middle. No, I'm so nervous. <laughs> 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 oh, no, oh, 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 it's looking angry. Oh, <laughs> it looks really angry, Mel. Oh, what is it? What is it? What is it? Well, be careful. Those are fangs. Those things are multiple fangs. Okay, what is it? What is it? Like, is it a... Okay. Oh. Oh, oh my gosh, oh. is that moving? Yes, it's moving. It's moving. It's going to get you. Those, like... Oh, no. <laughs> This is gonna, we're going to be known for this. Forever. Okay, okay, okay. I feel like it's let's one get, of those Let's get a guess. Let's shells. get a guess. Okay, it's oh, yeah. been taken out of the box. Oh, good. What is your is guess? Is it a, um, I don't know what they're called, but you know uh -huh. the things, the shells with the spikes on them? Oh, a cone shell? I don't know. Is I that what they're, they're called? I think they're deadly, so I hope it's... <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Either that or it's a okay. succulent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Should let's we? About, all right. Let's get to Nick and we will right. reveal what it was later. Oh, right. the end. oh very good. Who loves yeah. a bit okay. of suspense in the house? Right. Okay. Brilliant. So I okay. can have a go. Pass to Nick in three, two, one. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. It's enter. <laughs> enter the cage. <laughs> this is so unfair. The cage. Like. Oh. Ah, oh, what is it? Oh, 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 it's, oh my gosh. gosh. I am. What is it? So it gross. bounces. It bounces. Is it a bobble head of Jake oh, Bettlem? Really a gentle. bobble head of... Bob, not a bobble head of Jake Bettlem. <laughs> a bobble head of Jake Bettlem. <laughs> Sorry, that just came to Where me. Where can I get a bobble head it's of got, Jake Bettlem made? It's got giant fangs and... Yes. Uh, Okay. Oh, that's nasty. Fangs. Okay. It's hairy. Yeah. What's your is, guess? What's your guess? Is, it, well, that's got to be some sort of spider. Oh! Ooh, interesting. 
interesting. Okay. okay. Are we waiting till the end? We're going to wait till the end to okay. show you. Okay. 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 Just right. record that I was split. Oh. That the record oh. show I was oh. brave. I have to see Keep which the way I was brave. I have to We've got see some cheating going. contestants oh. in the house. Oh. I do cheat. Oh, I do cheat. You know, it's it's okay. Pastas don't need to be perfect. All right. Here we go. I'm just smash these two. I'm just totally smashing out. Okay. Last one. That was quick. She touched it. Oh my god. <laughs> it's okay. a rubber snake. It's a rubber snake. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your turn. Very good, very good. Okay. Hang on. Final one, final one. This final one. next one. Oh, oh this is off. a good one. Here we go. But, oh, she cheated again. Can you believe it? In the chat, yeah. if you see Pastor Mel cheat, no, can you please that, call her out for us? Actually. She's that person who you see, says I'm the gonna, word in celebrity yes. bands and stuff. Yeah, I'm going to be watching the chat right now. Oh, I've got some. Oh, okay, a shark. This one says a jellyfish Stop right saying here. Oh. <laughs> I would... You can go for it as okay. much as you like. It's okay. pretty as, gross. Here it as is. much as I like. Right. As I, I like so okay. much. Okay, oh. really dig your fingers in. You it's just like don't this. Know. Oh, 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 there we go. Oh, what is it? We have touched yep. down. Get... That, that is. <laughs> oh, okay. There screen. it is. There it is. Uh, yeah. Oh. Oh, he's. Yep. 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 I mean, you know, don't get too friendly. Yep, that's nice. Oh, oh, okay. What is it? What is it? Okay. Like some kind of. Okay, let's get a guess. Let's creature. get a guess. Three, oh, some, two, one. Uh, Give it to us. Jellyfishy thing. Jelly, oh, jellyfishy thing. Okay. Jellyfishy okay. thing. I mean, he's not wrong. Line fold off. All right. These okay. are the okay. items that you just oh. touched. We had a fake porcupine. Oh, fake porcupine. We had a porcupine. Yeah. We had a rubber snake, <laughs> a spider, and a jellyfish, all of which will kill you in Australia. They oh, will. Yes, they will. Actually, you know what? An echidna should not be the end of you. But if it is. Can we eat it? <laughs> you, you may eat it. That is your prize. Thank Can you we guys please so much thank Pastor Mel and Nick Hines? <laughs> and that is all from us Thanks, as well. Guys. Yes. Thank you so much for session joining four. our pre show. Enjoy oh, this next have session, the guys. Best see you time. soon. We'll see you later. C3 Global, so good to be hanging out together conference style. Woohoo! Yeah. Hey, this is Jason Schroeder. Mm, this is Emma Schroeder. Mm -hmm. And together we are Jason and Emma Schroeder. How about Amazing. that? Amazing. We are the lead pastors of C3 Hepburn Heights in Perth, Western Australia. Yeah. Have I like you ever visited us before? Yeah, have mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. Have you been? Mm -hmm. Because we have some pretty cool stuff. Yes, we are the land of the quokka. The quokka, you ask? <laughs> What is a quokka? Well, it's like a large, oversized, cute rat. <clears throat> wow, who's booking their ticket? It's uh, w But look, legitimately, we have some glorious beaches. We do. There are things in the water that may want to kill you, but fear not, good people. Uh, just dive on in. We love Perth. You we know the do. main reason why I love Perth? What is the main reason you love Perth, babe? It's because you're here. Aww. 
Scoring brownie points all over the place. Hey, without further ado, we are heading into session four. Yeah, session four. And you know what four means biblically? What does it mean biblically? (laughs) It means the number after three. (laughs) Ah, look at that. Session four, it's been amazing so far. Yeah. Leaning into God moments. And here we go. It continues in session four. And so we have coming up. We do. The senior leader of Kingdom City. Yeah, that's right. Mark Varagis is joining us. And Kingdom City based here in Perth, but spreading out around the globe and in multiple continents. And Mark Varagis is an incredible man of faith and looking forward to his session. Going yeah. to be blessed by that. And then following after that, we have an interview with Pastor Phil Pringle, the man Ooh, himself, yeah. along with Steve and Dawn Burgess. Wow. Mm. Now, I'm sure that's going to be insightful. Yes. And possibly hilarious. hilarious. Possibly, so, but looking, lean on in. Looking forward to that. But yeah. right now. Yes, coming time, up straight away. Time to worship. It is. Yeah. So we're going to be led in worship by C3 Alive Africa. Yeah. African style worship, baby. So good. Can't wait. Let's lean on in and worship our King who is worthy. Let's do it. Beautiful. Hey, C3 Global Family, come praise with us. This is how we praise Him here in Africa. You gotta get up and move. Lift Him higher, lift Him higher. Use what you have to bless Him. Lift him higher, lift him higher He's doing a new thing What no ear has ever heard What no eye has ever seen Is what the Lord is doing now When we lift him, he will show up and bring healing to Allah. We will prosper, we will flourish, we will flow in his blessing and rejoice in his riches. We will shout in victory and sing of what the Lord has done. Those guys. Rock wrote that song. Yeah. 
Pastor yes. Rock wrote the song. C3 Alive in Kampala, East Uganda. Africa. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. We love you, we love you. Amen. So people, we're having an awesome time here all day long, worshiping Jesus right here in Sydney, but all around the world, 64 countries, we're coming together as C3 Global, and this might be your first time you jumped on. Welcome. It's so good to have you here. Yes. We're starting each session with a time of prayer. And so we're going to be praying here and then we're going to have having somebody from New Zealand pray. Yes. And then Pat and Amanda Ancliffe are also going to help us pray. And in this time, I believe that we can really, Chris, yes. rock the nations in Jesus' name. So to speak, so rock to speak. the nations. So what I did there. Yes, okay. I saw that. You're so clever. Uh, <laughs> so let's pray, people. Yes. We're going to reach out to God right now yes. for His presence to it's touch all voice. of these nations in East Africa, yes. in New Zealand, and right around the world. Dear God, we ask you yes, now Jesus. that you will help our churches reach lost people. Yes, Lord. We pray for a tsunami yes. of souls coming into the kingdom yes, of God. Lord. There are so many things that are opposing the church in this hour. Heavenly Father, we believe that you'll answer this prayer. Hear us. Hear our prayer, O God. And Lord, help us send workers out into the harvest. And that, Lord God, you would bring a move of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to just be running churches every weekend. We don't want to just be having church and religion. We want to have a move of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. And our hearts are crying out, dear God, for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in all of our churches, oh God. We're worn out with religion. We're worn out with just doing church. We pray for that fresh, powerful moving of the Holy Spirit where people are born again. And they don't so much need following up, but they follow themselves up. They're so on fire with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Dear God, we pray for that kind of fire, that kind of wind to blow, that kind of river to flow, that oil to come in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Amen, Lord. Amen. Dear God, we praise you. Let's go to here from Tamari and uh, Tessa Cameron in, uh, in Tauranga in New Zealand. Thanks, guys. I love these guys. They're so fabulous. Yes. Lead us in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Oh, awesome. there yeah. they are. Awesome. Yeah, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you have uh, created you. And, and made us, Lord God, to be a supernatural people, Father God. And we thank you, God, for the Holy Spirit pouring out upon your people across the country, across the globe, pouring out your Spirit upon us all so that a move of God can take place through us. I thank you, Father. This isn't just a thing you want to do through just the pastors, but every member of our church, just Father. Thank you, Lord God. You're going to pour out your Spirit. And yes, God, I thank you for a hunger and a thirst, a passion welling up on the inside of every believer for a move of God, Lord, that we would begin to pray and that we would press in and that God, yeah, Lord, we would pray like those that have prayed for revivals of old, Lord, we would pray and press in for a move that we have not seen before. Your supernatural power will be upon our churches, that God, there would be miracles, there would be salvation, there would be healings. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for you turning up in power across every church and our movement in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Awesome, God. Thank you, Lord. God, on the 40th anniversary of C3, Lord God, we give you thanks. God, yes, we do. For a generation, Lord God, of incredible strength, Lord God, of passion and religion. Faith. And Lord God, we declare to the next generation, God, your marvelous works. And Father God, we call in the next generation of C3, Lord God, across the globe, in New Zealand and right around the world, Lord God, that this too will be a generation of increased strength and incredible faith and amazing passion. Lord God, let the, um, let, let the young generation, Lord God, come in. God, we call upon our youth and our young people, our young adults and our children and our babies. Lord God, that there will be strength in the generation. He'll be honour. He'll be teaching one generation to the next. In Jesus' name we pray. Yes, Lord. Amen, Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen, Heavenly Father. We give you all the praise. So, guys, we're going to join together with Pat and Amanda Ancliffe right now, who are the executive overseers of uh, our locations here in C3SYD, but also had an enormous amount to do with the expansion of C3, not just in East Africa, but right across that continent, and have a real heart for all of these great pastors and their churches in Jesus' mind. 
mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Well, let's pray for all of our great churches in Southern Africa, led by Pastor Anil and Judy Roscoe. Come on, all, let's lift our voices yes. for them Thank and you, pray and Thank seek you, God Jesus. for them. Father, we bless our C3 churches in yes, Southern do, Africa. Lord. And in the name of Jesus, we thank you that your hand is upon the leaders, upon the pastors, that you encourage them greatly in this time, Lord God. And for those who have had a tough year and in the middle of difficult circumstances, that faith would rise up, that they would be filled with faith, that they would be like the woman in Isaiah 54, that the barren woman would sing, and that those who have had tough times, they would sing, their hearts would be filled with faith, because they know that you are doing a mighty thing in the churches. Lord, we thank you that it's a time of harvest in Southern Africa. We thank you for it's a time when the church is built. And Father, we especially lift to you uh, our great pastors, Antoine and Joy and their little boy, Brave, and we pray healing yes. over the life yes, of Lord. Brave. Lord God, healing, healing in that little boy. And Father, we also lift to you our churches in Malawi, those that are in building projects, those that are purchasing land, that you would open the doors before them and that they would see miracles. And Father, for every one of our people that right now don't have income, that you would open the doors to income. Bless their businesses. Let income flow in the yes, name of Lord. Jesus. Yes, Lord. Father, Thank you, Lord. we pray for Pastor Rock and Deborah as they oversee West yes, and East Lord. Africa. Father, we thank you for your anointing upon them. We thank you, Lord. They are anointed to build your church, to expand. Lord, I thank you for every pastor in these regions. Lord, I thank you that by your Holy Spirit that you are filling them with strength, yes, with your anointing. I yes, thank you, Lord. Lord God, that you are expanding the church at this time. Lord, thank that you. our people will be strong, Lord God, in That's you. Right. Lord, I thank you for strength, Lord. I thank you for help, provision. Help, I thank you, Lord, for businesses prospering. Yes, Lord. And Lord God, I thank you that your people will stand up at this time, that the church will rise. I thank you that the church will be the light of the hill. And God, churches in villages, in towns, in cities, in these nations, I thank you, God, that you are established them to be strong lights in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord God. Give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. 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 Yes. Absolutely. All across East Africa. Oh, thank you. In Jesus' name. Oh, we do love. We love you if you're watching yes. Yes. from Uganda. Mama Christine's a love. Amen. <laughs> and right now, hey, we have an amazing worship song from C3SYD. There is a king. Beautiful. There sure yes. is.
Just hey guys. beautiful. Amazing. Hey, what it a good to great. worship God. So good. So no good. We've had some we incredible are. worship. How are you? I am James. This is my wife, Tam. Together we lead C3 SYD Oxford 4's oh location. Goodness. And we are thrilled by that worship because that was our team and they do such a phenomenal job. And we're so glad for them. We are. And hey, you uh, might be just joining us. Yes, there absolutely. Might be some freshies on, on Zoom. Hey, give us a little shout out. Say, I'm just joining in. Hey, Zoomers. So we're good to have you. We're thrilled you're here and we're in for a great afternoon together. Yeah, it's going to be morning. absolutely incredible. We have had so many great keynote speakers already. Ready. And my role right now is to introduce our first keynote speaker of this session, Pastor Mark Veragiz. He is from Kingdom City Church. He and his wife Jemima lead that church and they are doing a phenomenal job. In 2003, he was actually a lawyer and felt the call of God to leave his legal practice and pursue ministry. And then in 2005, after a personal encounter with the Lord, really felt called to go and plant a church in Malaysia, which is now Kingdom City Church, a global church having such a huge impact around the globe. He has such a phenomenal message for us here today. So I want you to get ready, take notes. It's going to be absolutely profound for you, your family, your church, every leader here today. So get ready and uh, let's go to Pastor Mark. Hey C3 Church Global Conference. Great to see you all online. What an honor it is to bring the Word of God. And I want to shout out Pastor Phil and Chris Pringle. And what a stunning legacy you are leaving and have already left to such a degree. Almost 600 churches globally, over 40 years of faithful and multiplied impact in the body of Christ. On behalf of myself, Jemima and our Kingdom City family and all that God is doing here, we are inspired from afar and at times from up close at the stunning impact of what God has done through you. Thank you for leading the way. Thank you for staying the course. And to every one of the team, every one of the pastors globally, whichever country you are in today, we're so glad you're with us. And uh, what a great privilege to share around building momentum. Building momentum is not only the subject and the topic, but is really the testament of what God has done through C3, at least from afar, watching as a young boy growing up, listening to the songs that came out at the church planning movement as it grew. And as I grew as a leader, always leaning in and watching Pastor Phil's hunger for God, his willingness to prioritize prayer and discipleship, the creativity in the life, there's phenomenal momentum that has come out. But maybe you in your city, in your location, where you currently are, you're like, I need to access this momentum. Maybe you're personally, you can be caught up in the momentum of a movement and not really be growing in the momentum internally within yourself. And that's why this is such an important topic. If I were to think back to school days and remember the the physical formula for momentum, it's 
mass times acceleration and to see what God has done over 40 years as the mass has increased, as the churches have increased, as the people have increased. The mass is increasing, so the momentum should be increasing. The real issue is often acceleration and acceleration in the kingdom is not running faster or even necessarily working harder. See, when it comes to acceleration, how do we increase that which God is doing in and through us? There is an untapped key that is often neglected, and that is the key of unity. Unity is found in Psalm 133. I just want to take a minute to read it. We often think unity, when the pastor says, I'm going to talk about unity, they're thinking, oh no, who's fighting? Who's the problem? Who's not agreeing with who? And we reduce unity to the medicine we bring from the cabinet to solve fraction or friction. And yet unity has a far more potent purpose in the kingdom. It's not just to heal division, it's to increase acceleration. And I want to show you that from the Word of God. Psalm 133, you know the verse. If you're a pastor, you've definitely used it, preached it. Here's what it says. Behold, Psalm 133 verse 1, behold. In other words, see, look, observe for yourself. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I don't know where you are, but say the word dwell. That's it. Say the word dwell. Dwell means we live in unity. We don't just visit it. Real unity and the benefits thereof come to those who live in unity, not to those who visit it at conference, visit it on Sundays, visit it on anniversaries, visit it on birthdays. You know, there's something about unity that is magnetic in its impact if we would dwell there if we would say god this is where i want to park verse 2 says it is like the precious oil we know what the oil is the spirit of god the anointing the tangible touch of heaven upon the head running down on the beard the beard of aaron running down on the edge of his garments verse 3 i'm going to come back to that verse 3 it is like the dew of hermon descending upon the mountains of zion for there the Lord commanded the blessing life forevermore. It's not hard to convince anybody about the benefits of unity. Who doesn't want a commanded blessing? A commanded blessing. Who doesn't want good and pleasant? But verse 2 is the one that's often almost like we're not sure what to do with it. We love the precious oil, but here's the impact. It starts on the head, flows down the beard of Aaron, all the way down, literally to the edge of the garments. And here's the point. Where there is unity, the anointing keeps flowing. The anointing keeps flowing where we stay in unity. So many people are saying, God, I want to be anointed. God says, stay united. I'll keep you anointed. Because when you dwell in unity, the precious oil that's on the head flows all the way down to the edge of the garments. You're familiar, no doubt, with the story of the woman with the issue of blood. Where did she touch the Lord to get her healing? The edge of his garment the tip of his garment the hem of his garment why is that significant because thankfully that day literally the whole body of christ 2000 years ago was anointed she didn't have the courage or the capacity to rise up and shake his hand touch his beard or or even touch his head but all she needed was the edge of his garment and she was totally made well that is the power of the body of christ completely united, completely anointed. And I believe that is a prophetic picture of what God wants, not only for the body of Christ, but also for C3, that the whole body is anointed. He still wants the, his whole body anointed. He's still the head and the oil on the head needs to flow all the way through the body. See, most people in your city, in your community, they will not get an appointment with Phil Pringle. They will not get an appointment with maybe even yourself. The real question is when they come to the edge of your church, the edge of your community, the edge of our church, do they get oil? Is there anointing oil at the edge? And this is the promise. So many people strive for more anointing and God says stay in unity and the oil keeps flowing. Whenever there's division, the devil understands division more intrinsically than the church because division, when it separates, the oil stops flowing. When I see a lack of favor or grace in an area, I don't check for lack of talent. I check for lack of unity because unity is literally the key. You know, one of my favorite testimonies was a guy in our church in Perth. Uh, he works at a car yard and uh, his name's Ian. He's, he, he serves in a hospitality. I had not met him up till this point, but I heard the story. And then since I've spoken to him and uh, on a Tuesday, he was uh, trying to sell a car and the client clearly wasn't interested, but he felt a prompting in his heart. Ian's just a good, faithful guy in our church, committed, and he's a part of it. And uh, this gentleman, as he was leaving, Ian felt a prompting, tell him about me. So Ian sort of 
did the internal argument, God, can I do that? Is it appropriate? Is it going to work? Anyway, stumbled and mumbled and fumbled his way through essentially sharing with this guy and yet there was a receptivity in that moment and this guy got saved. Now that's an incredible story all on its own and that's a testimony worth celebrating. Ian from hospitality, I call him, because he's not, he's not, he's not like a, lay, a pastor in the sense of the word. We believe everybody's in full-time ministry, but Ian led this guy to Christ and in the kayak it felt a little bit uh, awkward, but really thrilled that this man responded. As he went, a couple of days later, he had a thought, I, sh I should follow him up because that's what you do at church, right? We follow people up. And uh, he couldn't sort of track him down. Eventually, he found his number from the interaction they had on the Tuesday. And a woman answered the phone and was, it was a bit of a somber atmosphere because he said he was looking for such and such. And the lady said, I'm so sorry, he passed away last night. I'm his wife. That was not only stunning and staggering in the fact that this man in all likelihood went into eternal life because of Ian's obedience. But here was the real point. That man did not have another Sunday left in his life. Thank God there was oil on the edge. That man did not have another altar call left. That man did not have another weekend left. God still needs his whole body anointed. When there's miracles in the car park, when there's miracles in the schools, when there's miracles at homes, when there's miracles in the foyer, when there's miracles beyond just the altar, that's when we know it's not just the head that is anointed. So many people want to see the pastor because they've been to the edge of the church and there was no oil. And see, as a leader, you and I have an obligation to continue to speak the blessing of unity over our people and preach it not from worrying about whether people will perceive us as wanting our own interest but because we know what's at stake my tolerance for division and disunity is so low because it's not it's not about everyone agreeing with me or everyone seeing what I see it's I understand what's at stake and you know when I look at 40 years of what God has done there's significant momentum because the mass is growing but the acceleration is also growing see there's an acceleration where a real revival looks when we have have thousands of Ian from hospitality stories where people are coming to Christ and to faith and they're feeling the anointing like the woman with the issue of blood she will crawl her way through our communities to touch the hems of our church and that's why when I speak about unity I'm not speaking to a fraction or a fight or a friction I'm speaking to the next 40 years to the next 20 years to what God wants to do and they takes out of us the stress of God I want to be more anointed I believe in seeking the Lord I believe in pressing in I believe in pushing through but there's an anointing that comes when we dwell in unity where the oil on the head see when you look at Pastor Phil and Chris and you marvel at the grace on their life I don't know if you've ever considered this truth the anointing on the head is your inheritance what's on their life should flow through to your C3 church should flow through you not just to you but through you and that's why alignment agreement unity is vital but you know when we talk about that and you think wow well, I, I, I haven't paid the price he paid that's the point the head the oil on the head keeps flowing when we are aligned that's why the enemy will sow friction. That's why he'll sow division. See, we are way too charismatic for the devil. If all he's doing when he brings disunity or division is fouling up our friendship, we will rebound. We'll find a new friend, a new church, a new movement, a new, a new spouse sometimes. I mean, we, we, we rebound. But here's the point. If all he's done is stolen some of our time and our emotion, uh, you know, that's, not, that's a temporary loss. But I tell you something, he understands what he's really stolen. He's stolen the flow. He's stolen that which should come from the head all the way down to the edge of the garments. When people talk about unity, they're like, okay, I get it. I'm in. I'm in. What, what, what does it mean to dwell in unity? You know, if I were to describe unity as a fruit and peel it back to its absolute essence and its core. Uh, I think it goes beyond just alignment. It goes even beyond agreement. Uh, you cannot have unity without agreement, but there's something more intrinsically inherent in unity than just agreement. And I believe it's commitment. It's commitment. See, my wife, Jemima and I, we don't agree on everything, but we are united because we are committed. This, this is the challenge around unity. If unity is only as deep as agreement, the minute we disagree, we divorce. The minute we disagree, we split. The minute we disagree, we leave. The minute we disagree, we, we walk away. And, and then really what we have is, unless we all think the same, look the same, talk the same, we don't really, at some point unity is gonna be fractured. But if more intrinsic than agreement is commitment, when we disagree, our commitment 
pulls us back to the table to resolve it so we find agreement. See, commitment will pull you back even in the middle of fight and dispute and challenge. And, and there is something about commitment that is intrinsically uh, uniting in nature. You know, we know that unity is not uniformity. We know in the early church in Acts chapter 2, they were gathered in one place. 2020 is not the place or the time to gather in one place, but to gather in one place with one accord. One place is logistics, organization, event management. To get everybody in C3 globally next year, the year after in one place will take a lot of effort. But to get everybody in one accord is unity. Our church, Kingdom City, has grown over the last 14 years quite miraculously and God's done amazing things. But one of the things that I've had to navigate is the diversity of culture and location. That's why Pastor Phil is someone that I'm watching from afar. Because as, as we grow, as we expand, you can have a hundred campuses and have one heart. You could also have one campus and have a hundred hearts. Because the issue is not proximity, it's unity. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven and I don't think it was just because of logistics, it was because of unity. We understand the Tower of Babel, there was stunning unity, but, but what they united around actually was not in the heart of God. And just like negative people could unite and it's powerful, positive people could unite and it's powerful, the issue of unity and commitment is, and this is really what I want to leave you with, is not so much the fact that we are committed to one another, because I'm sure everybody in the room globally is committed. Acceleration increases, mass increases, momentum increases. But here's really what's at stake. Here's what's at stake. What are we uniting around? The Tower of Babel, they united around the wrong thing and God had to disperse it. In Acts chapter 2, they united around the right thing and God multiplied it. Why? Because what we unite around, just like you can unite, unite around the wrong things and create destruction, you can unite. Whether unity is a weapon that destroys or builds depends on what we unite around. And, and I want to just leave you with this. This is the season that if momentum is going to increase, not only in the movement, but in your own life, in your own church, yes, I'm aligned, yes, I'm committed, yes, I'm united, yes, God, I want the oil to flow all the way to the edge, but here's where we're uniting. We're uniting around the future, not the past. You've only got a modicum of commitment, liquidated from where it's been and invested into where we are going. Because when God calls you forward, don't look back, forgetting those things which are behind. It's phenomenal we get to honor 40 years but I can tell you now that's in the heart of your leaders already to look ahead for there is yet more there is yet more territory there's more unreached people and to park our commitment into where we are going is going to be the key to our acceleration that will determine whether the unity is literally something we look back on and nostalgicize over or we look forward and we build momentum can I suggest to you can I suggest to you like this if you unite around the past you create nostalgia if you unite around the future, you create momentum. And we need to look forward and say, God, what have you done? You know, one of the funny stories, I guess, that illustrates this for me personally, is uh, I, in case you're looking at me and still trying to work out what's my ethnic uh, makeup and why my accent is what it is, I was born in Singapore, grew up in Malaysia, Aussie citizen for the last 30 years, of Indian origin, so that just means I had identity issues. And so growing up, I wasn't sure whether I was an Asian, Aussie, or an Aussie Asian. And so I had challenges, which, you know, thankfully the Lord has continued to use me despite that. And then I married Jemima, who, although marriage itself is, has complications, she too had the same kind of issues, because she was born in New Zealand, She's born in New Zealand, raised in the Philippines, half Aussie, half Kiwi, sounds like an American. And so she had as many issues as me. And when issues married issues, you know, it was like this complex cocktail of culture. And, you know, it was fun. And, you know, we've had 12 years, 13 years of great marriage. We've got two boys and they're doing great. So pray for us, but so far, so good. She, Jemima's one of the great, uh, things that she was so proud of is she was one-eighth French. On her mum's side, she was one-eighth French, which, you know, I'm like one-eighth French. Our kids are one-sixteenth French, big deal. But it was a big deal. You know, they ate croissants on Saturday mornings. Her name is spelt the French way. You know, she had to go to French classes when she was young. I mean, it was a big deal. And, you know, I heard, kept hearing about Jean-Paul, somebody, some monarch from Monaco who, you know, whatever, big deal. And I was, you know, trying to be nice and honoring, especially in the early years of marriage. So I did my best. And then li literally one day she's in New Zealand and she rings me, I'm in Malaysia. And um, she says, oh my gosh, are you sitting down? I 
I said, why? She said, you know, my French great grandfather. I'm like, no, but I feel like we all know him, but you know, I don't know him. She talked to her auntie, found out, subsequently got DNA testing. She goes, it's a lie. It's all made up. And I fell off my chair laughing because I realized that everything she'd done, I was thinking of all the croissants I had eaten in vain on Saturday mornings because, you know, in honor of her friend. And I'm thinking, this is hilarious. Now, you might say, you're a horrible husband. You should have been supporting her. You should have been nurturing her through identity crisis. I said, so what is he? If you're not French, what is he? And she later said, oh, he's Arab. And nothing wrong with that. We love Arabs. We got church in the Middle East. But you got to understand, it was so funny because everything she thought that was true was now apparently a lie in, in regards to that. And uh, now we eat kebabs with hummus. It's our stable diet in our family. But apart from that, uh, you know, that week I was cheeky. I was in Malaysia. She was in New Zealand. I was sending a text like, love you, sweet daughter of Ishmael, X, send. You know, I, I said things that I cannot repeat at a C3 global online conference. And before you judge my husband husbandry, um, we actually had a lot, long laugh about it. And the reason we laughed at it was because my unity with my wife is not about where she's come from, but, but where we are going. So you can laugh at the past when you're united around the future. See, I didn't file that day for, for divorce, marriage on false pretenses. I thought I was marrying a 1-8. It didn't matter. Where she's from is irrelevant compared to where we're going. See, with the commitment in your heart today, I want to encourage you pastors around the world, let's unite around where we're going. As Pastor Phil declares vision, as regional leaders, as whatever happens, let's start to look ahead and start to dream. In the early church, it was male, female, Jew, Greek, slave, free, but now we are one in Christ. Let's look ahead to where God's going. This decade is still young. There are still years to be lived in this unusual season of disruption and pastors all around the globe. The best thing we can do in this season is say, God, we're going to stay in unity. We're going to align. We're going to commit. We're going to look toward where we're going. Oh, I'm glad for what you've done, but momentum is about where we're going. And Lord, may the 600 churches multiply again. And that is my prayer for every one of you. In fact, I'd love us to pray right now. Father, I thank you. You would displace any division and fraction that would in any way slow down the anointing in the room. And right now, globally, pastors around the world, those who are overseeing groups of 10 or 20 or 50, and those overseeing the hundreds and even the thousands, God, we just want to declare a unity, an alignment, a agreement, a sense of commitment that is at its core. Father, I thank you, God, that we can nostalgize around where we've been, but we are building momentum for the future. Father, we pray a blessing on Pastor Phil and Chris, the literal and extended leadership team of C3 globally. And we want to say in the name of Jesus, your best days are ahead, that we would laugh at the past because we have expectation for the future. Lord, it would be like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard all the way to the hem of every C3 church. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody with faith said, Amen. God bless you. Wow. Amen. What an amazing <laughs> word on unity, the power of our unity. And what I love about our movement is the power of our unity. We are so unified as leaders, but let's believe that to the absolute edge, as Pastor Mark said, of our congregation so that every single interaction in our communities, our cities is filled with the power of God and the love of God. Isn't that powerful? The power of Unity. Yeah, we've got some homework to do. We do. Hey, can we, <laughs> wherever you're watching from, Zoom, YouTube, can we you just see you. celebrate Pastor Mark and thank him for that story? Put it in the chat. Let's just give him a huge hand. That was so wonderful. And uh, if you are on Zoom, we want to be able to see you. We want to see your face. So We're make sure. a bunch of them, right? Yeah, But absolutely. there's a few cameras off. And there are heard. some handsome and wonderful looking people <laughs> out there. But make sure you do turn your camera on. We want to see you. When you turn your camera on, just remember that you are actually on camera. Yeah, don't go to the and, bathroom. Yeah, don't go to the bathroom or... or Change the chat the children. Clothes are not optional. You yeah. just, just keep it together. Keep it professional. Absolutely. <laughs> what are we doing now? Hey, look, we are going to see an incredible story. Um, we're going to tune over to our pastor, Richard Green. He's going to take us through an incredible story. And then we're going to see some greetings from some friends of C3 globally. So why don't you check this out? Hi, I'm Richard Green, Senior Minister of C3 Church Ride with my wife, Kathy Green, and a magnificent team. We lead C3 Reach, 
We've got church planners right through the world and particularly in very difficult places. You're going to hear a magnificent testimony of supernatural healing and the preaching of the gospel from our church planters, Yevgeny and Svetlana, who are in Kyrgyzstan and on the close to the border of Kazakhstan in a place called Karabalta. Uh, that sits on top of China below Kazakhstan and which is below Russia, formerly part of the, the Soviet Union. Now it's dominated by Muslims and it's very difficult to minister and they're doing an incredible job. So I hope you find this inspiring. Hey, God bless. Greetings to all C3 churches around the world. We would like to share our testimony about what happened during the pandemic in our family and in the, in the people's life around us. When the pandemic began, of course, it was unexpected for us, but in that moment we connected even more with the Lord, prayed even more, looked for Him, searched for Him, felt His presence, and we have seen God's miracle in our lives, in all areas of our lives. But firstly, the first miracle that did happen to myself, I've got COVID but did not die. Yes, I got seriously sick, but since the ambulance did not come, the hospitals did not work, did not accept the sick, we trusted in God, we prayed. And thank you very much to all of the churches, pastors, because without the medicine, without the doctors, God gave me healing. And at that moment, when I was sick, the Lord called my wife and me to pray for other sick people who were also uh, sick and were in a very serious condition. Many of them were already practically dying. Lung damage was from 80% to 100% for many of them, for most of them. And at that moment, we, when it was hard for us, ourselves, we prayed for miracles. And these miracles happened. The people who, for whom we were praying got healed even though there was a very difficult form. Yes, and our grandfather also had 85% lung damage. They said there was no chance he was taken to the hospital. He had already seen hallucinations, he was suffocating, but an incredible miracle happened. God called me to pray just as my husband felt bad. I prayed all night for my husband and for grandfather. And the next day a miracle happened and my husband started to feel much better and the hospital, the chief doctor, uh, he called and said, I'm just in shock. When I went to check on him in the ward, if everything was all right with him, he was not there. Uh, the doctor thought that he was dead, but it turns out he went for a walk on the territory of the hospital. It was amazing. The doctor just called and was shocked. He says, I have never seen such a thing. There has never been uh, such a case that with uh, such damage of the lungs, on the second day a person lives for a walk. Because even with 50% or less lung damage, a lot of people unfortunately died. And we also prayed for financial miracles and God settled the hearts of the people to bless us. We thank everyone who helped. Unfortunately, due to, to the fact that we uh, were quarantined, our whole family was left without work. But we were not worried, and as never before, we, we were united by God. We felt the strongest presence of God in our family and in our home. We hoped only for Him, and God made incredible financial miracles in our life that we were, we were able to become a blessing not only for our family, but also could help many people. We bless everyone, we love everyone. Thank you very much for your support and prayer. Amen. Hi to the C3 Global family. It's J. John, your favorite Greek Cypriot evangelist. And my wife, Killy, is the camera woman. 40 years. Congratulations to Archbishop Phil and Chris Pringle. You two are godly. You are gracious. You are generous and you are gorgeous. You're not growing old, you're older and you are growing. You guys, 40 years, you've got the ruby. Now go for gold. Hey, congratulations Phil and Chris on 40 years in yeah. ministry wow. at the church and 
And yeah, I guess you guys started at five years old, maybe 10 years old or something. Uh, that's amazing. So congratulations, 40 years is a significant. Yeah, moment. that is no small thing, 40 <laughs> years. And we love C3, we love we you do. and are just honored uh, to be building God's kingdom with you. So congratulations, yeah. you guys, 40 years, hugs from congratulations. us. Congratulations, we love you so much. Bye. Bless you guys. Hey, Pastor Phil and Chris, Mark and Darlene here. We just wanted to take a moment and say a huge, heartfelt congratulations on 40 years of ministry. Amen. Congratulations, we guys. Are well done. so grateful, aren't yeah. we? Yeah. Right from the very second that we arrived in New South Wales about, I don't know. 35 years ago. 35 years ago. You guys have been there. You've always encouraged us. You've encouraged us on mountaintops and you've encouraged us in valleys. You've encouraged us when many people walked away. You've just stayed there telling us that God is faithful. Amen. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you both so much and we speak great, great blessing. Ephesians 3.20 over everything that is in your heart. Love you guys. See you soon. Amen. Beautiful. Amazing. What an incredible thing to hear the stories of those championing us across the globe. Yeah. Can we just love on one another? I can see you on the big screen up yeah. here. Go on, give me a little hands up. Pump the roof. Years. Come on, more of that. More of you. Come on. So yes, good. beautiful. It's we fantastic. have really had a beautiful foundation. Yeah, we have. But we're looking towards the future. Yeah, and we have a great documentary about our 40 year de journey. And so on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Check it out when you can. Spread the love. Let the yeah. people know that the documentary is there it's for us beautiful. to just embrace yeah. our story. It's so powerful. So what do we have now, Jimmy? We have our Global Voices, which is an opportunity for us to hear really short messages, three short messages from our pastors around the globe. And we are kicking off with Lars Halverson. Lars and his wonderful wife, Megan Lee. I've seen you online. Church this morning. Going. We can see Megan there on Zoom. So good to have you with us. We absolutely love these guys. Love Lars. So let's go. Hello, C3 Church, global family. Lars Halverson here coming to you from Darwin in the Northern Territory of Australia. I'm so excited to be bringing a short encouragement to you here today out of something that was uh, quite an embarrassing moment for me about six months ago, when uh, we were all in lockdown around the world. We were fortunate enough in Darwin that we could still leave our homes and go into our offices to work. And uh, one particular day, I was just reversing out my driveway to go to the office. And all of a sudden, there was just massive crash, bang, the car came to a standstill. What is going on? I hopped out, went around the back, and to my absolute embarrassment and humiliation, I had reversed into the gate of our driveway. Way. And uh, it was just a bit of a low point for my masculinity and my ego to reverse into the into the gate of our driveway. However, I was actually uh, pretty quick to turn it into a positive because that meant I could actually go and get a new gate. One of those ones that you press the button and the thing opens uh, for you and you don't have to get out of your car and open it and get wet if it's raining. And uh, So I actually decided to, to, to go shopping and, and get a really nice gate. And why do we need a gate in Darwin? Well, there's a lot of crime. Every house has fences. Every house has a gate. And because if you don't have one, people will just go into your property, help themselves and carry your stuff out. And that's just the nature of, of the city we live in. I know it's like that in many places around the world as well. And so I began to research about my gates and how I was going to, uh, what sort of gate I was going to get, how I was going to install it, how it was going to operate. And in all my research, it actually got me thinking about a scripture that Pastor Phil has embedded deep into the heart and the very core of who we are as C3 churches globally. And that is, of course, the scripture in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, where Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As I began to research the, the gates, I realized that, you know, when it comes to uh, gates, what the, all they do is protect your property. All they do is, is to keep people out and to keep your stuff in. And that's certainly the case for, for my house. And I think it's the same for hell. It's to keep 
people that they're trying to keep out from coming in and taking their stuff. And guess who that is? It's us. It's the church. We're the ones who are called to actually go and empty hell and l- let the let the people out who are who are lost, the people who are broken, the people who are bound, who are imprisoned, who are captives to all their bondages and brokenness. And that's the mission of the church, as as we all know. I'm preaching to the choir here today. But I want to encourage us that Jesus gave us this picture of a church as an army storming the gates of hell and he gave us a certainty about that is that we're the ones on the attack and hell is actually the one that's trying to defend itself and and as he says in the scripture hell is actually incapable of defending itself against the church and so we need to understand that it's not the church that's under attack from hell hell is on the attack is under attack from the church The greatest reality right now, even though it seems like hell is being unleashed upon the earth, the greatest reality is that Jesus has actually said, I'm unleashing my church upon hell. And the opportunities are there for us as the church, uh, even greater right now, I believe, than ever before. And so my first point is this, is that gates are defensive, not offensive. Gates are there to defend and the church, we are the ones on the attack. You don't, if someone steals stuff from my house, I don't send my gates down the street to chase them. They don't move, they're just there to defend. And so we have nothing to fear from the gates of hell. If anything, the gates of hell has a lot to fear from us, the church. My second point is this, is that gates can be crashed. As I discovered in my driveway that day, if you hit your gate, with enough force, it will twist, it will buckle, it will get blown right apart. And I believe that that is what Jesus had in mind for the church, is that when Jesus says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, it means that we are coming with so much force that hell is totally incapable of defending itself against the power of the, and the cohesion and the, the, the strength of the church that's coming against it. My third point is this is that the church will continue to storm the gates of hell. The the church will continue more and more over time. So it's just as true right now as it was when Jesus said it, and even more so. The world has seen all kinds of things come against it over the years. Pandemics, famines, wars, natural disasters. And each time the, the church goes from strength to strength. And I really believe that for the church, the greatest days are ahead for the church. There are great opportunities that are opening up for the church globally. And as God's people, we, if we have this strength, if we have this spirit of faith and of certainty that, hey, we are going to be victorious. We just need to be vigilant. We need to be strong. We need to be full of faith. And we need to be looking for the opportunities that are around us. I just want to pray for us all, uh, to encourage us all as we come to a close here today. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your strength. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your promise, Lord God, that there is victory for us as the church and that each one of us, we have a role to play in the global church. And Father, regardless of, of how little or how great our role is or our seeming success in the moment, we know that we are part of something that is so much bigger and that you have declared and you have promised that we're going to take ground and we're going to overcome. And so no single one of us has to carry the weight of responsibility to fulfill this promise because Jesus, you fulfill this promise. So Father, strengthen us, fill us with your spirit, lift up our eyes so we can see the great opportunities ahead of us. Bless each pastor, each leader as they watch today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Lars. That was amazing. Yeah, we do. We need that word. And so, hey, can we just shout out to Pastor Lars? I'm sure he's hiding online somewhere. So good. Love that word. We love you both dearly. Hey, we are going to kick into another short preach, but don't go anywhere. We're going to kick over to Pastor Emma Bird and her and her husband, uh, Joel. They run uh, KL, uh, Hope City KL. And uh, we're thrilled to hear the word that God has placed on your heart. So let's kick over to Pastor Emma. Hey, 
C3 Church Global and a huge happy 40th birthday wherever you're celebrating today, watching with your church or at home with your family. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to come and just for a couple of minutes, just encourage us as leaders and as team around the world, just helping to forge churches that are alive and just serving our cities wherever you find yourself. Uh, my name is Emma and along with my husband, Joel, we run C3 Hope City in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And uh, we've been here for about six years. We've got two sons and we absolutely love life here. I would invite you, but you know, flights are down and all that. So <laughs> maybe sometime in the future, but it's a huge honor to be a part of all that's happening today through conference and to celebrate with all of you. I wanna bring a quick encouragement um, because I think as leaders, we've been so focused on feeding our flock, on encouraging our people, um, that perhaps we haven't taken our own words uh, for ourselves. And so maybe I can just flip some of them um, just on ahead a little bit, that it would just penetrate your heart and your soul. I understand there's probably so many pastors right now that are watching this, that are facing trial, facing challenge, just got huge decisions ahead of you to make. Uh, maybe you're feeling just battle weary from the last, last kind of six to nine months. Well, I really want to encourage you that God still stands with us. Even right now, his presence is, in, is with us through this conference today and he wants to minister to us. I'm hoping I can help to bring some of that to you wherever you are today. But I want to look at uh, Joseph. If you're taking notes, it's called Mastering the Setbacks because Joseph, even from his teen years, starts getting kicked in the teeth and the first bash comes from his brothers. <laughs> Can you believe that? It's the worst, isn't it, when it comes from family? But his first setback is from his brothers. He finds himself in a pit, finds himself sold, founds himself alone, owned, belittled in a foreign land, uh, somewhat lost. And then just when he thinks life is on the up, he gets falsely accused and he ends up in jail and then he's forgotten about and some time passes uh, before he ends up getting another shot at living. And so I feel like he's the master of the setbacks because Joseph doesn't seem to suffer setbacks. He seems to come through setbacks. And we see at the end of the story when he reaches his 30s and is in charge of the whole of Egypt and got everything at his fingertips, all power is his other than the throne. Uh, he's just had all of these setbacks and knockbacks instead of them weakening him and leaving him bruised and battered. He's come out so strong, able to make wise decisions to help people and do incredible things. And so that's how I want to come out of COVID-19. Instead of just looking bedraggled, <laughs> like I need a really long vacation, I want to come out strong and ready for 2021 and the rest of this decade. So here's a few observations um, so that we can come out with some sass like Joseph did. Uh, his composure and confidence in who he is. He wasn't jaded. Uh, he wasn't angry at the world, um, but he used his setbacks uh, just, to, just to gain in faith and in strength to live out the calling that God had given him. Uh, Joel and I, uh, along with our church, moved into a brand new venue at the start of this year. And after six weeks, we locked the doors, <laughs> sadly, due to the lockdown, hoping it would be about six weeks. And obviously now we're six months seven months and counting, still can't gather in our building with our congregation. And what a ride it has been, 2020. I feel like it's gone punch, 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 punch. And I feel with three months to go, if the rest of the year is something to go by, maybe there's a couple more punches, I hope not, uh, to come in the next few months. But I really wanna uh, encourage us because as relentless as it can feel, our God is good. And our scripture tells us that God, even from the pits of despair, God can lift us up and God can do something good through this situation. And we've been telling our congregations that God's faithful. God is strong. He's for you. He's going to bring you through. He's a God of miracles. He's going to bring healing and provision. And we've been shouting out all these incredible miracles and stories that have been happening around the world. But, but for ourselves, we need to come into a place of recognition and realization that this is true for us too, that God has got something good in this season for us. He's committed to revealing that to us. And so uh, I'm believing that although this season has been a little bit hectic. It has also been a season of unprecedented miracles and renewed understanding and wisdom. And it's all preparing us for the season that is ahead. And so uh, if there's just maybe three things that I can pull out that I really believe that Joseph held on to through his setbacks, rather than becoming bitter and twisted and angry and frustrated and just angry at the world, instead he held on to three things that I really believe are pretty key for us to hold on to as leaders in C3 to see our churches thrive in this next season. And so the first of these would be our conscience. 
to do what is right. Let's hold on to our integrity. You know, in the pressure as leaders to bring your church through stronger than ever, bigger than ever, uh, whatever it is that we feel like there's just a pressure to prove that we made it through COVID-19 and we led our church effectively. That pressure can lead us to just in a panicked fashion or or just uh, in, in a sense of insecurity, of just thinking people won't think I've led well and I'm no good at leading. We can just push our team and we can strive in ourselves and we can do some crazy things in an effort to try and maintain something. But let's just do what is right. Let's not submit to that pressure. Uh, don't cut corners. Don't be rewarding yourself uh, for your service, but let's wait on God's reward. Come on, our integrity guards our peace and our authority, and we are gonna need that in abundance for the season that is ahead. So let's hold on to our conscience. Secondly, compassion. Come on, even in jail, Joseph is worrying and caring for other people. It says in Genesis 46 to 7, when Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. This is the cupbearer and the baker. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? Come on, let's not get all hard and cold. Let's not get clinical while we're in this online season and we can't physically hug and embrace and, and contact people so easily like we used to, but let's remain soft in our heart that he would care about others even while he's locked up in the same place. He's worried about why they are feeling so sad. Let's hold on to that compassion. We see it again later when he's compassionate towards his brothers, forgiving them for just setting him up on this crazy ride and beating him up and, and disowning him and all these terrible terrible lies that they did. We find that compassion in action again. Let's remain compassionate because you know in the small things, if we're faithful, God will bring us to places where we have huge opportunities to be compassionate, to be loving, to be all sorts of things to the people around us. Don't harden your heart as God takes us through this. Confidence is my third one. He under Joseph understood that his gift was from God. Come on leaders, don't push to the side the fact that God has anointed and appointed you for your calling. You're, there's all sorts of things that we get in, involved in in life, but there's some things that we just know God spoke over. It might be your location, the type of church that you're planting, uh, the, the, the niche that your church, the, the slant that you guys have to serve your city in a particular way. There's certain things that God spoke over you. There's gifts on your life, whether it's healing or the miraculous words of knowledge to pass to, to preach, to teach, to whatever it is, you know there's an anointing on your life. And I feel like over COVID-19, so many times we've considered to ourselves, oh, I just don't know if I'm the one, if I'm the one. Come on, let's not throw away our confidence. It will be richly rewarded. God hasn't been bashed and bruised through COVID-19. All that he has supplied you with, that oil that is in you to minister and to bring release is as fresh and as pure as it ever was the day that he gave it to you. So come on, our circumstances right around us right now are not eternal, but the God that we serve is. And so I really want to encourage us to hold on to that confidence in God, that that which he starts, he will complete. Come on, he's going to take us through this whole ride. Let's hold on to God. Let's not give up in doing good. And I really believe that we're going to see something so fruitful come from this season. So leaders, come on, hold on to your conscience. Do what's right. Let's be compassionate, remain soft hearted, and let's hold on to our confidence that we will one day see that rich reward, but also that we'll get to the end of what God has entrusted with us to do in this season. I love you so much, church. God has so much in store for us. I'm so honored to be a part of the team globally with each one of you. God bless you and enjoy the celebrations today. Amazing. Hey, can we <laughs> thank Emma? That was such a phenomenal word, keeping us strong, Very getting good. us through this season, filled with character, compassion, and the absolute conviction that God is with us. Thank Hearing you so much, Hearing some shout-outs on the set, aren't yeah, we? Absolutely. Keep quiet over there. <laughs> we, need, we need to give a big shout-out. That was such a great we word for word. us. Put it in the chat. Encourage Joel and Em. They do such a phenomenal job. Well, our final global voice for this session is the wonderful Clarence Shashi. Him and his wife, Debbie, lead Destiny C3 in Malaysia. We're so thrilled. He's on the Zoom chat right now. So again, give some love and let's hear from Clarence. Hey, 
C3 Global family, how amazing is it that we can still meet in this era of shut borders and social distancing with the help of technology. To those of you who don't know me, I'm Clarence. My wife Debbie and I are the senior pastors of the Destiny C3 Churches with locations in Malaysia, India, and the Philippines. And for the next few minutes, I have the privilege of making some observations for you. And I want to do it from Genesis chapter 26, that one chapter that is directly dedicated to the life of Isaac. It starts off by stating that a severe famine had struck the land and Isaac moves to Gerar. It says in verse 1 to 6, where Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, lived. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Don't go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land and I will be with you and bless you. And it says in verse 6, so Isaac stayed in Gerar. Isaac chooses to obey God because Isaac knew that his provision or his blessings come not from being in a promised land, but it comes from being with the promised giver. His security was not the economy, the weather, the political landscape of the land where he was. His security was in the faithfulness of his God. You know, today some of us could be looking at the natural circumstances. There's a pandemic that has hit the land and the circumstances surrounding it could have dire consequences. You know, the hardest time to trust God's word is when things look bad in the natural. But here's a couple of things that Isaac does in this time that we can learn from. Firstly, he chooses to obey God. He stays in the land. Then in verse 12, it says, Isaac sowed in that land. He applies the principles of the kingdom for his life in a difficult time. Isaac was certain that the principles of the kingdom that worked for him in good times would also work for him in tough times. You know, naturally, it would have been safer to not sow. It would have been a lot easier to go down to Egypt. Egypt represents the world, the world system. It's a move to fear, to worldly understandings and methods. Isaac applies the principles of the kingdom regardless of what it looked like in the natural. And it says he reaped in that same year a hundredfold and he prospered. You see, the giving and the fulfilling of the promise is God's responsibility. The obeying and the laying hold of the promise is our responsibility. And I believe there's never been a more important time for us as believers to stand in faith and lay hold as churches, as individuals, as families, as a movement to be like those who through faith and perseverance inherit the promises of God. And I believe that like Isaac, God wants us to stay in the land. And I'm not talking about a physical land, but stay in that place of promise, stay in that place of faith. Don't move to Egypt. Don't move to fear. Don't move to redefining your standards according to what the world is saying. Stay in a place of obedience and trust in God. The principles of the kingdom work regardless of the condition of the world. It works because it is based on the economy, strength and health of the kingdom of God. So we, going on, it says, God blesses Isaac. Now in verse 15, it says, the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham and they filled them with dirt. The Philistines represent the devil and his devices and they put dirt between him and the water. You know, sometimes we can have Philistines that are squatting in our minds, filling it with dirt. Hey, we can't stop God from blessing him, but maybe if we throw some dirt in, we can block that flow. It's not that the water isn't there, it's just blocked by what the enemy had put between Isaac and the water. Maybe between you and the blessing is the dirt that the enemy has been filling your well with. The lies, the fear, the negativity, saying things like you're not worthy, God doesn't love you, you're mistaken about your call, you're going to end up a failure, dirt, dirt, dirt. But here's what Isaac does. In Genesis chapter 26, verse 18, it says, Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of his father. He digs again. He deals with and removes the dirt that was in the way. What do you and I need to recognize in this season and remove as the dirt that the enemy has put between us and our source? Note that he goes back to his father's wells, the wells that he started feeding from. He goes back to his foundations. Sometimes we need to dig up our foundational wells again, go back to our history with God, get a clear perspective again, get realigned again, go back to the purity of our call, go back to the heart of the Father for us. You know, there's one thing I'm certain about this season is that in this season, God wants us to go back to our foundation. I see God doing a reset on churches, families, lives, a reset on prayer and worship, taking it all back to its original form and purpose. There were a lot of things that we added on to our natural and spiritual lives that we deemed as essential, but we had to drop off some of these things in this season. I see God taking us back 
to our foundations. Isaac went back to his father's well. He dug again and it says he called him by the names which his father had called him. Start calling things as they were originally called or named by the father for us. Maybe even for your life. Before you took on these names, these titles, these positions, there was a name that the father gave you. The core of who you are. You are a beloved son, a beloved daughter. Go back to that space with God. And from that place, Isaac digs new wells. From verses 19 to 25, it says Isaac finds water, but people come to steal. They argue over it. They, he calls that place argument. He leaves that place and he digs again. He finds water again. And again, there is dispute. And he calls that place hostility and he moves on. You know, sometimes we need to call it what it is, move on and dig again. What are those things in your world? It could be relationships, it could be positions, it could be businesses, ministries, certain decisions that you've made. And you're hanging around this well of argument and hostility and it's keeping you from moving into a space that God has for you. You know, Isaac had to decide, I can either stay here in this place of argument and hostility, give reasons as to why I belong here, or I can just call it what it is, move on and dig again. And because he did that, in verse 22, it says he finds a space. This time there was no dispute away. Isaac says, at long last, the Lord had created a space for me to prosper in this land. There was a space that God had created for Isaac to prosper. There is a space that God has created for you to prosper, even in this pandemic. You know, from this journey of Isaac, we know sometimes your blessings come immediately. Sometimes it's a journey of walking with and trusting God. The hardships Isaac faced were not meant to deny him. It was meant to channel him to that space that God had prepared for him. And I'll end it with this. Like Isaac, your challenges today are not keeping you from God's favor and blessing. It's moving you, channeling you into that place that God has prepared for you. God bless you, global family. Love from your city family in Malaysia. Have a great conference. Beautiful. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, I just, as we were listening to that message just here, here in the studio, I honestly think there is some parts of that that God actually wants to unwrap a little more. Mm. Um, as you step away from this busy day, I think God is going to speak to us on a new level for that. So can we just thank Pastor Clarence for yeah, bringing in a beautiful. word that's going to bring change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hey, we're going to hit an exciting live segment yes. now, which could go either way. I'm joking. It's going to be brilliant. We are going to hand across the studio our live. We're going to have a wonderful interview with Pastor Phil and also uh, Steve and Dawn Burgess who head up C3 Howick in New Zealand. Can we take it away in this amazing segment? Well, how good is that? We are seeing so many great messages come out today. I thought that uh, Pastor Voragues' message, Mark Voragues, was just genius. And then from Clarence and Emma and the others, all through this conference have been absolutely astonishing. I'm amazed at how many great preachers we've got. Look, just before we get into this interview, I want to say this, that at the, in the next session, which is the last session for the day, make sure you're on board with that. I have got such a word in my spirit for our whole movement. And I'm going to be sharing it right then. So tag a friend, wake them up, shake them up, do anything. Get your group on, tell your leaders to gather together. Because I know that there will be an impartation for our movement in that meeting. And I'm looking forward and relying on you who are watching right now just to tell somebody else and get them involved. Right now, we've got the great pleasure of talking with Stephen Dawn Burgess from Howick, New Zealand. Welcome, guys. <laughs> you are funny. Hey. <laughs> you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, do you know where I could get another one of these? Yeah. Um, I'm looking to make a bulk purchase for my car. Maybe some of the other pastors... Uh, who are listening to this might want to do the same, but where could we get this in large quantities? Oh, you can get it from philpringle.com, plus all the other books. Philpringle.com? Yeah. <laughs> I thought philpringle.com was where you got art and sculptures <laughs> and the like. You, you, from there. you can get books as well. Yeah, and uh, Amazon. Mm -hmm. And online, there's a brand new book released today called Do It Now. And uh, we released that just today, mm -hmm. especially for this conference. 
Okay, so I can just go to philpringle.com. I'll go to philpringle.com <laughs> when I log off, as the kids say. <laughs> log on on the internet, as the kids say, yes. On the big World Wide Web. So good to have you guys here. We're talking about change. So good. Leading people yes, through change. change. You have yes. led, you've led people through change. Tell, tell, us, how you, tell yes. us how you've done it. We have. Okay, so change is constant, uh, and we lead people. Change is a constant thing in life. We really shouldn't be surprised uh, that church leadership or leadership in any setting requires us to lead people through seasons of change. Uh, there's a change that accompanies the unexpected twists and turns of life. Uh, they are like monster-like waves. Uh, either we're going to be flexible enough to adjust in our leadership style and our strategies, or the wave is just going to take us wherever it's going to take us, and we're going to end up wherever we end up uh, at its mercy. Uh, so we've led through some of those monster waves. Uh, it's not change that you go looking for, but it's change that comes looking for you. But then there's also the kind of change that you do go looking for. Uh, as pastors of churches, we are agents of change, at least we're supposed to be. Uh, we're trying to bring about the establishment of heaven on earth. That is a dramatic change. And so we want the church to grow. We want our businesses to grow. In order for them to grow, uh, change is necessary. So it's weird that Christians have a reputation for being so resistant to change. We really shouldn't be. Uh, the status quo may be safe and comfortable, but it's not fruitful. And we're not faithful if we remain there. So leaders need to be ready to lead through change we need to be ready to lead through change so that the waves that come looking for us don't knock us off course and can actually help us to get to where we want to go. And we also need to be ready to lead through change in order to grow beyond our status quo. Oh, it's, it's, it's so true. I'm telling you, the, the Christian church possibly is the most RTC, resistant to change, group in the history of the world. I mean, when I first came to Jesus, like around 50 years ago, uh, they were still singing hymns from the Roaring Twenties. And, uh, and it was like, you couldn't sing any of the new songs. That, that was too worldly. It was like, uh, the more old fashioned you were, the more holy you were. And uh, to replace the organ with a synthesizer, that was almost like asking the devil into church and to, uh, to, right. to, to play anything with a beat or, I mean, there were so many scruples that were wrongly based and kept the church in the dark ages. I think we are actually meant to be out on the cutting edge that the mind of Christ in us yeah. should not be a restricting influence. It should be a releasing influence into change. And so to overcome all of that religiosity that tries to hold people in their, in the, in the, in the, in like Roman togas and organ music in the old, I, still it is in the world today. And people look at it and say, how could the message be relevant when their packaging isn't relevant. And I think that constantly, it is a constantly and more accelerated process today that we've got to keep changing. Wouldn't you think, Dawn? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, change is imperative. It's here and we need to be the ones who are leading our people through it well. Uh, I just had a couple thoughts on that. One is that we have to have a really clear and compelling vision, you know, if we keep our church focused uh, on the vision, where we are trying to take them, then change makes sense. If they can see the direction that we are leading them in, uh, I think that kind of orientates the change, makes it easier for them to get on board, to follow. If you can keep articulating, keep repeating uh, that vision over and over. So everyone in your church, everyone on your team knows it. Uh, and that helps to yeah, make sense of any change that is happening, I think. Um, and probably another key uh, with leading through change would be great communication. I think it's hard to communicate too much. We have to communicate through a variety of means. Uh, we often think people get the message or they've heard it, uh, but actually they've missed it. So we need to uh, communicate clearly and comprehensively 
You know, there's a, a funny scripture Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, then who will get ready for battle, right? So if we're not communicating clearly, letting people know uh, the expectations, where we're going, what we need, then how will they know what to do? It's too disorientating for them. And, and Pastor Philip, I can That's just amazing. say a couple of things. Number one, n- number one, you have been brilliant uh, at embracing yes. change and always being willing to change quickly and adapt quickly. And number two, Dawn does still wear a Roman toga around the house <laughs> on weekend. Sensational, as long as you don't. No, no, no. What I would, completely liberated. What I do think is that you guys are phenomenal communicators. What Dawn has just said, uh, I am in their app WhatsApp group and Dawn uh, and Stephen Dawn run the Pacific region for C3. So they're heavyweight people. They've got a bit, lot of responsibility on them and they're doing incredibly well. We have so many new churches, growing churches, changing churches in this region of the C3 family because of these guys leading so strongly. But they're not just leading strongly, they're leading smart. And what Dawn just said, uh, in this WhatsApp group, which I'm a, I'm a part of, even though I'm not in New Zealand, but I, the level of communication that they put out for everything. I mean, these guys are into the details. Like I'll see a WhatsApp when they're at a conference. Uh, Steve will put out, everybody meet in the lobby at 6.30. I'm going like, wow. And in terms of what Dawn just said, that is as clear as it gets, people. There's no mistaking. So we're all, so everybody knows about it, and they, then they all start talking about it. And then they're talking about airfares home, <laughs> who can get a cheap airfare. Then they're talking about who can take them in a car from here to there. So they're constantly involved in this communication. That's what makes a community yeah. clear constant right. communication and helps people uh, navigate change. What do you do, though, with the people who resist change, Steve? Um, look, I, th- I think we have to be realistic and we have to understand that in every community there are going to be quick adapters. Yes. Uh, there, there are going to be those that um, maybe drag their feet but will embrace change eventually. And then there are going to be the dullards, the laggards, who who just. Um, I, I I think it's important for us to place our attention more on the quick adapters and let them set the tone for the community, uh, because then there's a really good chance that we're going to get the majority of our people going, and it creates a sort of a tide, it creates a current. Uh, if we focus our energies on the laggards. Uh, on the slow adapters who just are kind of dispositionally slow, um, then we're going to create that opposite tide that's going to drag us out to the sea of uh, of of um, slowness. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. I've milked into for all. But, but that's true. Uh, some people call that the law of thirds. Uh, and as a leader, you need to be not focusing your energy on the bottom third who are dragging and and resistant uh, and not even on the middle third who are ambivalent. But on the top third, Mm -hmm. if you give your attention to the guys who are on board and strong, and this applies not just with change, but with general leadership in, in, in general all over any organization, concentrate on the strong and you'll find the ambivalent, the, the middle who are undecided, they actually come on board. They'll say, yeah, that's where the attention is. That's where the momentum is. That's where the oil is. And you generally might even pick up a half of that bottom third. Those people who were resistant and against it can actually come on board. So I think the mistake is running after the problem people and ignoring the strong. Because in that scenario, the strong start to feel neglected and can even become part of the undecided or even become resistant themselves. So it's important to pour yeah, oil, pour, pour petrol on the fire. <laughs> what were you yeah. saying? Yeah, the middle, the middle third is a swing state. And if we can create <laughs> that current heading in the right direction, 
uh, then we're going to develop momentum in our churches. Exactly, exactly. So in terms of the uh, content of communication, Dawn, uh, you were doing, bringing such a, a lot of wisdom with what you said there about frequency, co communicate a lot, and uh, breadth, communicate to everybody uh, all the time. Uh, talk about the content of the communication. What uh, should be said and what doesn't need to be said? All right, I think uh, it's important to focus on the why we're doing things. So if you Beautiful. have that vision there clearly for them, uh, it's really empowering if people know the why. You know, we're doing this to see salvations so or good. we're doing this because, you know, we need that friendly culture or whatever it is you're trying to change, give them the why for it. Uh, and I think it's great to empower your teams and your people to figure out then the how, how do we go about doing it? I think you can leave that uh, to your teams, let them take ownership of stuff. Uh, we're just explaining that this is why it's important, this is our heart, uh, and then you can get that buy-in and head in the right direction together. Exactly. I, I think as well, I think as well, part of the world, we're, we're always trying to create language uh, that everybody can get a hold of, That's which great. is going to give us a shorthand to uh, bring people's attention back to the vision or our cultural distinctives or whatever it is. So we're, we're always creating phrases which we introduce in our staff or in our church to try to uh, keep people heading in the right direction. Exactly. Uh, and that's keeping it simple, right? Yeah. yeah. What you said, Dawn, is... Uh, is phenomenal. I, I couldn't have wished for a better answer talking about that. The content of what we are sharing is the why. And can I say this, that the best way sometimes of communicating the why is a story. When you get somebody to say, well, I was in this situation, I met the church, I met somebody from the church, they introduced me to Jesus and now my life has completely turned around. And then everybody sees the why actually happening yeah. in front of them and think, this is why we go through all that we go through. This is why we need to keep making the change, et cetera, et cetera. Any final words from either of you on change? <laughs> um, I, I think it's really important for us as leaders to uh, to lead ourselves and to look after ourselves. I think during seasons of change, when there's uncertainty, I think what our people are looking for is uh, even temper. Uh, I think that we are the canaries down the mine. So oftentimes people are looking to us for health and vitality. And so I think we have to be on guard. Uh, I think during busy seasons or seasons of change, uh, I always cling really close to my life-giving rhythms, things like devotion, diet, uh, things like patterns of sleep, uh, things like exercise, all of that becomes really crucial because uh, if we can keep healthy, we can keep strong, we can keep that even temper, uh, then people are going to feel um, uh like there's, safe. yeah, people are going to feel safe. People are going to feel like things are steady and okay and we can kind of negotiate the season. Uh, that's exactly yeah, right. Absolutely. Hey, Dawn, were you going to say something? Yeah, just thinking about your kind of key team as well. I think it's uh, so important to make sure you're taking them on that journey of looking after themselves as well. Um and like we've been talking a lot at this conference about kind of soul health. So I think with your team, make sure that you plan to have those moments of refreshment when they're sitting around, eating together, laughing, telling the old stories. Like just to have those moments uh, is just as important as, you know, the praying and the planning and the, all of that stuff. Um, it's to make sure you're looking after your souls and your team's souls as well that's great that must be hard to have a laugh with steve because he's such a serious <laughs> yeah. kind of a person right? <laughs> <laughs> <Absolutely. laughs> i think it's very wise to seek us out for advice um and you can always feel free to contact us privately if we can get any further assistance thank you very much um, for that for a fee i imagine 
Yeah. For a fee, but it's in New Zealand dollars, so you'll be fine. It's affordable. <laughs> Congratulations on the State of Origin one last night. Thanks so much, guys. What a brilliant uh, piece of information there. Gold, I'm telling you, for each of us as leaders trying to take people into the future and always it's going to be a challenge between those who want to, those who are not sure and those who don't want to. But as leaders, that's our job, to take people often where they don't want to go, but they kiss us when we get there, especially in terms like building funds or buying buildings or changing leadership and all these areas. It can seem unnerving because we don't like the unknown. But as you hear from God, as you look to the Lord and you get something from God in your spirit about it, you, you can do anything. You will find that that will resonate when you share what God has put in your heart. It will ring a bell in the spirit of everyone in the church and they'll know that this is what they're meant to be doing. God bless you. Thanks so much. We look forward to the next session. Awesome. Amazing. We need to change. Yes. We're going to change. We will. <laughs> do it well. Do it well. We Thank are doing so it much. well. So look, we are so thankful to uh, to these guys for that incredible session. Can we just pop some emoji clap hands in that uh, yes. in that box there? For, go on. Yeah, and if awesome you're on real YouTube, ones. get some comments up. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, Steve, Dawn, Pastor Phil. Beautiful. Hey, as we come to the end of this session, I want to let you know Pastor Phil's new book, Do It Now, his ebook is out now. So do right it now. now. Order it now. It's up on the <laughs> screen and uh, make sure you go ahead and do that. We are coming to the end of this session. I can't believe it's over already. Well, not Have you yet. had fun in this session? Come on, show me some love. Let me know you've had a, a good time on Zoom. So great. Well, we're going to take an hour break right now and then come back for session. Session five. So make sure you come early, get ready for the pre-show. It's going to be an incredible time. Now, before we do that, I want you to stay online. We're going to praise together. And I actually think you should be standing for this moment. Yes, we're going to kick need. it back over across the globe from where we are. And we're going to go into another praise song from C3 Alive. And I have to remind you that both of these songs that we've uh, led one another in over the last session have both been written by Pastor Rock, C3 lead pastor over there of, um, of our incredible uh, C3 Alive. So, hey, why don't you stand where you are? Why don't you lift your hands? Why don't you praise God and dance with one another? Let's go. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved the name.